can I now introduce our first speaker? And we are extremely privileged to have here today Sir Crispin Tickell, who is or it says is, is a diplomat. Well, you were a diplomat, yes, was, was. <laughs> Whose posts include British Ambassador to Mexico, Permanent Secretary of the Overseas Development Administration, and British Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He's also Chairman of the UK Government Panel on Sustainable Development, Chairman of the Climate Institute of Washington, DC, and is a Senior Visiting Fellow at the Harvard University Center for the Environment. He has been Chancellor of the University of Kent and is a former president of the Royal Geographical Society and is a patron of the Optimum Population Trust. Ladies and gentlemen, we're extremely privileged to have today as our, guest, as our main speaker, Sir Crispin Tickell. Well, after that introduction, I have to reassure you that I am, in fact, human. <laughs> I also think that I ought to pay tribute to the very interesting presentation we've just heard, which I think took us through some of the things that we're all thinking about and worrying about. Now, what, what, leaves, what, what is left for me to say? I thought I'd take, ask you to take a step back and look not just at the energy problem, but at the kind of problems we face as a whole, because it's, um, it, they're, they're extremely complicated and um, we have to see things in a much wider perspective. But first, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to come. My warmest thanks to all of you who invited me to come. Um, things have changed a lot since I was here in uh, 2006. It's very gratifying to see how beautiful this is. And of course, the sun has obligingly come out to, to remind us how beautiful it is. Um, but of course, I particularly want to say thank you to Richard uh, Knox Johnston and also to Alistair Gould, who are going to be talking, I think, later in the program. Well, you've spoken already, and Alistair's going to speak later. So, take a step back and look at all these interconnected problems. We have, if, I, if one has to give a list of the problems which I think most serious at the moment, you have to look, first of all, at population increase, human population increase the world over, and its consequence, which is moving, changing patterns of migration, which is already, as you know, agitating everyone a little bit, and it will agitate them still more in the future. We've got loss of biodiversity. This is the year, so-called year of biodiversity, in which we're looking at the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, which was signed, I think, what was it, 1991? So they're looking again at all that and seeing what it means. And before you think biodiversity is really the kind of thing that you could talk about in abstract terms, you must remember that we are all part of biodiversity. And that for us, for each single person here, we have 10 times as many bacterial as body cells in our own bodies, and that we are very much part of the living world, and we forget that at our peril. So the good health of the ecosystem, the good health of... Uh, of the, of the environment around us is absolutely vital to our own welfare. And then, of course, we are, have the way in which we're, redu we're reducing resources. Resource depletion is an absolutely critical issue, and we are destroying the world around us at a great rate. And I think if you look back at the Industrial Revolution, which began in this country some 250 years ago, and then see what effects it's had, you do, in fact, have to sit down and, and uh, brush your face a bit because it's really, very worrying. In those years, the human population has increased enormously. The source depletion has increased enormously. Um, the environment around us has changed a great deal. And climate is merely one of the factors which we have to think about for the future. Now, what are those really big issues that one has to think about them? And I'll come back more specifically to the problems of, of Kent in a moment or two. We've obviously got to get away from the kind of consumerist complex, which means that everybody wants to eat more, everybody wants to buy more things, um, and we want to go on eating more and more resources, which is why economists like talking about gross national product as the measurement of prosperity. In fact, all that GNP and GDP really mean is increasing more goods and services. 
So a real disaster increases goods and services because you have to cope with the disaster. It's a most un inefficient and most unfortunate way of looking at economics. And one of the things that I think is most important is that we should look again at all of that. We have to realize that market forces by themselves are not enough. We have to, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but market forces are not enough. And we have to start measuring things differently, looking much more towards human welfare than towards producing more things, because producing more things isn't, isn't really going to solve any of our problems. Tell that to a politician, tell that to a treasury economist, and they'll throw you out of the room. Now, the most practical issue, which is the theme of this conference today, which is, can we keep the lights on in Kent? And I think sometimes we forget how far we have come. Now, we, you've just been reminded of all these very fascinating ways in which we can generate energy. And um, I think that uh, I don't want to repeat what was said. Let me just say just a quick word about the, about the fossil fuels on which we depend. The current estimates of how long they'll last, and remember that the Industrial Revolution and current society depends on those fossil fuels. The sort of guess of a rough kind is oil, perhaps 40 years, uh, gas, perhaps 60 years, coal, perhaps 220 years. Re recognizing that those figures are very rough. I've been hearing in the last little while about new oil technologies, like um, the, the whole system of uh, residual oil recovery, by which you might get much more out <coughs> of the power stations than we have so far. So it, there's a lot of, lot of fossil fuel around. But nonetheless, it is quite important that we, that we do heavily depend on it and that the reserves are diminishing while the demand for them is constantly increasing. There's an interesting change of balance between the use of those fossil fuels as well. I don't know whether I, th this is something which I'm sure you all know, but recently somebody measured where the, the resources came from for electricity within the European Union. And in, within the European Union, at the moment, it is 25% comes from gas, 20%, quite a reduction to coal, and I think around 30% from nuclear. So you see the balance is changing uh, already, and we have, to take, we have to take good account of that. Now, the fact that we are dependent on these fossil fuels and that our current society grew out of their use, I think has to be reckoned with, has to be taken good account of. But there's another factor we should think more about, and I think that's going to be more <coughs> important in the future than the depletion of these sources. It is the kind of effect it's having on the environment, and indeed you've heard about how these various different kinds of sources, what effects they have. People talk a lot about food security. They talk on the whole less about energy security. But if we talk about energy security, <coughs> where is all this stuff going to come from? It's going to come very substantially from the Middle East and from Russia. Uh, this is the fossil fuel stuff again. We have to consider that as a major issue that faces us in the, in the future. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, the demand for energy from whatever source is constantly increasing. In China, I believe that the energy use was doubled between 1990 and 2006, and is likely to double again within the next 10, 10 to 15 years. So you've got depletion of resources, you've got the environmental effects of use of those resources, and you've got constantly increasing in demand for those resources. So it is quite a substantial array of problems. And I think, what should we do about it? Well. I don't want to state the obvious too vigorously to you because you know it all already, but the first thing I think we've got to do is to make better use of the resources that we're now using, and that means make, making better use of fossil fuels, greater efficiency, and developing new technologies to reduce their effects on the, on the atmosphere. Hence, you've been hearing about carbon capture and storage, um, and uh, one of the things that I favor very much, which is the subject of a book by my son, Oliver, uh, is the idea of having annual auctions of permits to emit greenhouse gases, which is quite a nice idea. So every year there would be a, an international auction at which you would, um, you would have to bid for permission to emit gases. And the money that was thereby raised would be used to develop alternative technologies. I think we also have to agree on the need for looking at other sorts of resource. We've heard a lot about, the, for example, the Athabasca tar sands. I was at a big meeting on the subject last week. Um, that's obviously going to be a resource, but the penalty that you have to pay for using that resource is probably extremely, extremely high. 